I know that we're really trying to condense a lot of history and culture tonight. So I'm going to try really hard to keep a, a 10,000 foot view because honestly, I, I know for myself and I think most of our audience is largely unfamiliar with Islam and Islamic culture and you know all the different forms that it takes worldwide. Can you talk to us a bit about what marriage is, quote, like supposed to look like in the Islamic faith? Well, um, <clears throat> there is there is no um, when it comes to most things in Islam, there is no umbrella. Most of the questions you would ask in Islam, it, it depends where you ask them. So if you ask the exact same question in a country like Egypt is going to be a complete. The answer is going to be completely different than if you ask it in Saudi Arabia or in Afghanistan or in North Africa, the, the, the other side, uh, Algeria, Tunis Tunisia, for instance, where they are way more liberated. So I cannot tell you <clears throat> really an umbrella answer. Uh, marriage in Islam looks like X because you will always have a different image to that. However, if we try to gather the majority uh, of, of Muslim people and, and their understanding of uh, marriage, it's basically... And this is how it is also written in the book, in, in the Quran. Marriage in Islam is basically a contract for having sex. Now, before anyone jumps up and down and, and, and really gets frustrated with this, no, this is not marriage in Islam. They are loving people. Of course, they're loving. And the majority of Muslim friends I have, they're like any other couple, two loving couple who, who, who are just married. Mm -hmm. But we have to differentiate between how people uh, perceive marriage, because we live in society after all, so you, you act and behave in a way kind of similar to the society that you're living in. And so we have to differentiate between that and what the dogma is is saying. So the, mm -hmm. the, 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 dog, the marriage in the dogma is it's a contract for having sex uh, and it has a, a, um, a monetary uh, return for that. Yikes. So does the Quran itself have pretty explicit instructions? Is there anything that's considered, I suppose, canon within uh, the majority of the faith? Or is it incredibly splintered? Absolutely. So, so, so the Quran is the authority on that. And, and whenever people argue anything about marriage, of course, the the answer has to come from the Quran being the authority um, mm -hmm. in the religion now two <clears throat> two main things uh about marriage in islam one it is clearly instructed undebated in the quran that a man has the right to have multiple wives but mm. not the woman so <clears throat> it's it's uh it's polygamy uh, level two because it's not even equal between men and women you cannot say it's a polygamous relationship it's, it's only polygamous for the man mm -hmm. uh, the man is limited to up to four uh, four wives um, the woman also uh, uh, the, the woman is only allowed uh, one husband mm -hmm. now as I said that is not uh, debated and it is it is clearly instructed in the Quran however that doesn't mean that every Muslim woman accept that um, we're, we're human after all, so it, it is very frustrating. And the majority of the Muslim world do not live by uh, polygamy. The, mm -hmm. the majority of the Muslim world, they are monogamous. Um, but again, that's that's the differentiation that we have to make between how we feel and behave as individuals and as society and what the authority of the book and the dogma is teaching us. And it causes a lot of conflict when a man wants to have sex with multiple wives and they introduce the idea to their current uh, wife and she opposes the idea. The automatic answer is like, but God allowed me to. Like, mm. who are you to oppose the idea that I want to have sex with another woman in a halal way, in, 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 a, <laughs> in a religious, legal way? God gave me that, so... 
Yeah. Anyway, sorry. Sorry for the rambling. <laughs> I, I would love to be a fly on the wall in that conversation <laughs> as well. Yeah, it, it's certainly not the same, generally speaking, but I've been the therapist in the room six months after that conversation uh, more than once. And uh, it is... It is not good for the whole family. It can be a little <laughs> bit explosive for sure. Uh, I, I guess, Adam, I'm curious about uh, how how much the Quran really has to say about Islam. And I know that's, that's such a vague question, such a vague concept. But as much as Christianity or maybe the Bible specifically has to say about marriage, there are precious few like actual instructions and so the way that we choose to interpret that, the things that we pluck out and say are super important and absolutely cannot be violated. And then the things that we sort of like, well, you know, that was that was the Old Testament. We don't really believe by that uh, it is really messy and complicated. Can you tell me anything about the the different ways that it's practiced, uh, different denominations or, or sort of just a overview of how this ends up looking in the real world? When it comes to marriage, there is not much of differences in, in terms of denominations. So there are four main denominations in Islam, mm -hmm. and they all seem to agree on the same concept of marriage. <clears throat> However, there is still enough room because, as we know, any book is open for interpretation, so you sure. can interpret the book in, in, in any way you want. Well, not in any way you want, but <laughs> so. um, because it's the book is open for interpretation, there have been multiple types of marriages, and let's put marriages in, in a quote. Cause, sure, yeah. Um, so in, in Islam, um, and again, uh, take it with a grain of salt, because when, when I say in Islam, that doesn't mean every Muslim uh, person would, would agree with that. But mm -hmm. there is definitely a, a sect or a group in Islam that agrees with something called Zawag al-Muta. Zawag al-Muta is a... Uh, Zawag means marriage, and Muta means pleasure. So marriage for pleasure. And as the name suggests, that is um, a contract. Um, think about... You're a contractor, so you're not a full-time... Uh, employee in that contract uh, it, it's a contract for let's say three months or six months or whatever uh, it has a um, a stated value uh, that you have to pay this amount of money of course for to, to the woman so the man pays that money to the woman in order to have a pleasurable marriage which explicitly sex <laughs> um, for for that period of time but that doesn't, um, as you can see fr fr from that concept, there, there is a lot of ignored responsibility in that kind of contract. Mm. Um, it, it, this marriage should not uh, bring forth kids, for instance, um, because it's a short-term marriage. Um, there are, and again, these things are not written in the contract of marriage, but it's just, a, it's, it's a no-brainer, because if I know that the contract is a six-month contract, well, if the woman falls pregnant, well, that's her fault. That's that's her problem. It, it's, it's not my mm. problem because from the get-go, it was a six-month contract. I'm not going to father this kid. Other Muslim groups may say, well, no, sorry. If, you, if the woman got pregnant, you have a responsibility towards that kid. Here, you get a lot of tension and debate, and people will start arguing what is the moral action to be taken in this mess and that's when the quran is very important because you have to go back to the book and somehow find verses or passages that will back up your your argument mm -hmm. what would god say in this um, in this scenario uh, again sorry it's, it's a very wide answer but there is no one size fits all in in marriage in in denomination islamic deno in muslim denominations when it comes to marriage <clears throat> 
Okay, so follow up question to that. I'm kind of curious in these kind of situations. Is there any kind of debate that goes on uh, regarding like family planning and birth control? Is it considered, you know, something that is the the woman's responsibility to do or or are they not supposed to be doing anything to prevent pregnancy or what's the I, I realize you just said not everyone agrees, but is, is there a debate around That's the mechanism? It? Yeah. When it comes to birth control and uh, family planning, uh, the Quran is very clear on this and nearly everyone agrees that you should not. It, it's no one's responsibility, basically, <laughs> because you shouldn't uh, do family planning and you shouldn't do uh, birth control. Um a lot of people may say, well, how dare you saying that? The majority of Muslim families in the world would have uh, two to four kids or whatever whatever number you, you come up with. People still practice birth control. People will still hmm. put a cap number <laughs> because you cannot have 20 kids and, and look after them. However, uh, the Quran says, which, which means you have, basically, you should have as many kids as it's it's an investment basically the, the, the meaning of that verse is your kids and your money in life are your investment in life so mm. who are you to say that you should invest only ten dollars not a hundred thousand dollars the more the merrier um so yeah it, when it comes to that it's uh it's no one's responsibility and in most cases if the man wants more kids the woman have has to give in Unfortunately, that's the sad reality. Mm -hmm. Because Got again, uh, God gave me that authority. Like that's what God said. Who are you to oppose that? Sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Who are you to oppose my will? I mean, God's will. <laughs> and every How time, convenient. Even, when when you try to speak with logic and reason, like, come on, we have five kids. We cannot have the sixth one. You can come from a, a logical position, but I can shut down the conversation. But well. But God said, like, yes, I get your reason, I get your, but God said, and that automatically, uh, if you assume that the two people in this relationship are religious, <laughs> yeah, you're right. Well, God said, so. Yeah, I guess you can't right. argue with God. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, speak to the manufacturer. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, you've mentioned um, a few times already that obviously Islam is practiced, you know, differently all over the world and, and is practiced all over the world in various places and different, you know, contexts. I'm wondering if you could speak at all on some of the ways that Islamic marriage may have evolved or changed in some of these settings in response to things like colonialism and globalization that may have affected the social and political and economic contexts in which people are engaging in marriage mm. that's a good question <clears throat> so on one hand because of globalization and and uh, now we're we're living in the age of information and internet and you can see how the rest of the world living marriage has evolved into mostly monogamous uh, in, in Islam. So I, I hardly, I personally don't know anyone who is currently uh, polygamous. However, um, in, in certain countries, the, the polygamy is still heavily practiced. Uh, we're not talking about odd cases. We're, we're talking about a, a, a good percentage of the population is still practicing polygamy. But one interesting um, phenomenon you can um, you can research uh, is when when Muslims who believe in polygamy uh, immigrate to other countries. So some Muslim people live in America or, or live in Australia or so forth, where polygamy is not allowed by law. Uh, I'm not sure about America, sorry, but um, in, in Australia, you, you cannot have multiple wives. I'm not sure if it's the mm. same thing in America. Not not yes. legally, yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So Or not the, legally the, the recognized work... as wives, but in any exactly. case. Exactly. So, so the work around that is you have one legal wife um, in, in front of the authority or in, uh, in, in the registry, and then you have three girlfriends. Mm. And they all know about each other, and, and they all internally – 
between them, they know that they have all equal rights and they're all wives. But in terms of the legal system, uh, you only have one wife. So then you have to, um, I don't know, r write a will or to, to make sure that all the four wives are getting equal uh, distributions of your inheritance. And so you try to work around things. And, and that is um, one big aspect of how globalization and uh, living in the new modern times, uh, mm -hmm. colonialism and, and so on, how it impacted the, the, the shape of marriage in Islam. Mm. Yeah. Well, I, I heard you describe it uh, or describe marriage, I suppose, essentially as a as a sex contract. And that makes sense to me. Uh, but <laughs> more generally, I mean, what are some of the expectations for marriage that are uh, laid out in Islam uh, and how how realistic are those expectations? I mean, what what percentage of marriages do you feel sort of try or at least aspire to like live up to those ideals? Ooh, that's a can of worms. Um, <laughs> sure. <clears throat> because when it comes to marriage, it's it's kind of like social media. <laughs> you, you, you never put out your dirty laundry in front of others. Yeah. Uh, every person present their marriage life to be loyal and faithful and beautiful. And mm -hmm. it's such a blessing having 19 kids. And <laughs> is it really true? So... <laughs> Yeah, to, having a role model marriage to aspire or, or to to look up to is, I don't know. <laughs> it depends on your <laughs> perception, really. Yeah. And how uh, how how much of a tinted glasses you're you're uh, you're wearing. Yeah, I mean, is it but, clear what is expected of a wife and yeah. expected of a husband? Absolutely, and and um, and again, that will will bring us back to the question that. Um, Kara asked earlier about um, how globalization and colonization, uh, colonialism um, uh, impacted that. So let's address first, yes, there are expectations. So one, one expectation, if a man uh, goes to marry a woman, he has to pay al-mahr. Mahr is a uh, lump sum, big money uh, lump sum that you have to pay at the start of the marriage and that money goes to the um to the wife or the wife's dad um <laughs> it depends um but this money is paid to the uh to the bride in order to <clears throat> establish the contract mm -hmm. now even though it, it is a sex contract uh, it, it doesn't uh, give the man a uh, free ticket from all the other responsibilities. He has to care for the wife uh, throughout life. Uh, he has to pay for her needs. Uh, he has to take care of the kids and uh, provide for this family and provide for, for everyone. Uh, so it, it comes with a lot of responsibility and expectations on the man's shoulder and also on the woman's um, because she's expected to raise the kids so raising the kids is primarily the, the woman's responsibility and uh, she has to take care of her husband and she has to <clears throat> to agree to sex whenever he wants. And we can talk about this a little later, but yes, mm. a woman should not say no to sex um, at any time her husband wants. Um, so yeah, the, the woman also has... Uh, responsibilities um when it comes to marriage but the the interesting thing why i i said uh we, we'll go back to kira's question because we're living in this modern times now in a lot of countries like of course not saudi or uh, restricted in countries like tunisia or egypt or these countries the a lot of women now are in the workforce. They, they do work and they help to provide for the family and they, they earn. And, and that creates a very interesting dynamic because it throws the expectations off because the default position is that the woman stays at home, takes care of the kids, takes care of her husband, and the man provides. Now, what happens when the woman is 50-50, like trying to throw in as much money because life is hard, she's working and she's providing also 
does she get any um any of the responsibilities taken off her shoulders not really you're still <laughs> expected to carry on with everything plus it's good to have extra money <laughs> but yeah it's one way how the globalization and and this new world we're living in throws off 1,000, 1,400 years of, of tradition and uh, our understanding of marriage. It's amazing. I mean, regardless of the religion we're talking about, uh, the way people will try so hard to take those old ideas and pretend that they make sense in our modern world uh, when, when they so clearly don't. Uh, Especially you... in ways that tend to privilege men. Yeah, well, I mean, yeah, I mean, yeah. Yeah, Just yeah. Put that <laughs> that out does there. seem to be the trend line, you know. I'll acknowledge that. That's very true. Yeah. Privilege, Just, man. What, what do you mean? <laughs> it is no. equal between men and women. Like, right. Yeah. The, everyone does the same amount of work, you know. <laughs> sure. 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 It's that. <laughs> want, and everyone is paid down. equally <laughs> too. <laughs> Yeah, well, how yeah. how are uh, unions formed? I mean, uh, how are people expected to find each other? Are we talking in many or some cases arrangements from parents uh, or are people generally able to meet in whatever way feels right to them? What does that dynamic look like sort of across the diaspora? Across the diaspora is completely different. Well, I was going to say, before you said across the diaspora, um, I was going to say it depends how um, where you live and how strict the, the community you're living in. Mm -hmm. uh, if we're talking about um, <clears throat> it, <laughs> it's very interesting because when when I when I first came to uh, Australia, we were talking uh, nearly 15 years ago, mm -hmm. it was shocking that I found a lot of um, Arabic uh, fam Arab families who are still living a lot by by tradition and and they are almost afraid to to follow the American lifestyle or the Australian sure. lifestyle. They really think that yes, we came here seeking better life, but we have to hold on to our tradition and uh, our religion. If this is the mentality, then you will find a very traditional uh, thinking way of thinking uh, when it comes to marriage. However, it, it has to get loose at some point because the, the and again, it depends how religious you are. Some women are ambitious and they want to work, and and that creates a different dynamic. While others are like, okay. Um, I will be a stay-at-home mom, and here in Australia, there is social benefit for that, so you can get payment from the center link, and um, you get also payment for uh, each child. So they kind of, <laughs> they're almost milking the system um, while the wife stays at home, and they can practice their traditional idea of marriage, um, and the man tries to provide, but with the support of the government, then it, it kind of works it's um again it's not one size fits all uh different people in the diaspora act differently and again it depends what the system provides because australia is completely different from america from elsewhere in europe yeah um they make it work somehow <laughs> <laughs> so it sounds like people adapt their practices to fit the the context that they're living in Mm -hmm. Totally, totally. Sorry, yeah. and I, I missed part of your question about how people meet and arrange marriages. <clears throat> um, and, and again, that depends on how traditional or how strict the, the community you're living in, even if you're living in the, in the, in the state, uh, in the States or, or in another country. If you are living in an in a open-minded society where people actually, men and women, meet, then you might find someone and... Um, it, it, it's as easy as that. Uh, in in a lot of other cases, uh, you still go by not arranged marriage, arranged marriage as we have it in the Middle East, but kind of you always meet the woman through someone, through her brother or a friend, and you never meet um, unless it's out in public. So you meet in public, 
or you meet indoors with the presence of others, but you're not uh, you're not meant to meet one on one because that will so, lead to something bad. So there's not like a Muslim mingle app or anything like that that people can get on. <laughs> the Muslim <laughs> Tinder. Um, yeah. No. <laughs> um, well, I'm pretty sure that there there are uh, very liberal Muslims who who sure. they, they have. Um, Muslim mingling communities and you can really freely meet people who still believe in the same thing. I'm, I'm not really trying to put a, uh, a black shadow on, on Muslim people. As I always, I will continue to say, it's not one size fits all. There are liberal Muslims who probably meet and greet like everyone else and, and, and meet people in the, in the normal way. Uh, but I'm, I'm reflecting more on the traditional and the old style, which still sure. exists today. So I hope that doesn't offend anybody listening to us today. Um, yeah. I'm painting a particular picture. Well, and it really is worth saying just one more time that we are talking uh, in such abstraction about such a large number of people across cultures, across history. Uh, and so, you know, I, I hope for a little bit of forgiveness, but I think it's almost... I don't know. I'm a little bit upset, honestly, to just acknowledge my ignorance here and how large... Uh, these communities are and yet are not well covered in our media, are not are certainly not reflected in our educational system, and that there are so many norms that I'm just completely unfamiliar with. I mean, for instance, I don't know much of anything about divorce in Islamic culture. I mean, is there a, a mechanism for divorce laid out in the Quran? Actually, yes. And when it comes to divorce um, in Islam, it's, it's a lot easier than <clears throat> in Christianity, for instance. Mm. Uh, so it, it, even though it's still frowned upon, it, it's not like, uh, yeah, sure. <laughs> sure. <it> <laughs> um, but yeah, the, the, the Quran and Islam is very uh, clear on divorce and uh, specifically a, a woman's right in the case of divorce and what she gets out of the, uh, out of the marriage. Um now, there is a very interesting and nasty part of the divorce in Islam. Um, and for anyone listening, forgive me if that doesn't apply to all denominations of Islam, but um, I know that it applies to um, Sunni Muslims uh, in, in Egypt uh, in particular. So one, one thing is when you divorce a woman, you basically tell her face to face, you're divorced in Titala. Mm. Um, and, and that ends the marriage. And then you go through the legal uh, system uh, and, and the paperwork. You're allowed to, let's say uh, a few months later or a few weeks later, you realize that you did a big, terrible mistake and you really want the woman back. You can go and say, well, I'm really, really sorry. Would you take me back? And if she's kind, she will take you, take you back. And that happens, uh, especially if you have kids and you want to bring the family together. So you can do that. And uh, let's say you have some sort of anger management issues. So a number of months later, you go like, Inti you're, you're divorced again. And you you do that. So the, 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 the nasty and the funny, not funny, really, not funny, haha. Um, but the nasty thing is you can only do this three times. Um, you can divorce a woman three times. Uh, and the third time, you're not allowed to have her back. And here is here is the the nasty thing. Let's say you have uh, the, the woman has uh, has Stockholm syndrome, <laughs> uh, the, the the love of the abuser. Mm -hmm. Let's say after the third time, the man comes and apologizes, and, and and the woman still accepts the apology, and she wants to go back into that marriage after the third time, where the religion doesn't allow it. Then you have to have something called mehrim. Uh, sorry, uh, Muhallal. Muhallal is a another man who has to marry that woman for a period of time and then divorces her so you can have her back. Fantastic. Uh, <laughs> what? <laughs> I mean, it, it is not terribly dissimilar from Christian notions of virginity and just the central idea that sex with a man changes you on some sort of like fundamental level mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Yep, absolutely. So, so the woman has to go through that muhallal process, um, having another husband uh, for a period of time, and then going through. The, and, and of course, there is a lot of under the table business uh, that happens in this, where the muhallal will ask you for a lot of money to because. They they know they they're here here to play a role. It's it's not marriage mm -hmm. marriage. Uh, they are just trying to fix the error. Uh, so yeah, there, there's a lot of nasty business under the table. And then some men will marry the woman and then uh, refuse to divorce. And like, what can you do now? I married your woman, but I'm not divorcing her. I like her. And yeah, a, a lot of nasty Yikes. stories in this area. And I, I understand that in these circumstances, it sounds like the woman does not have any say in these proceedings. Like she can't say, well, I'm divorcing the second guy. I don't like him. Like, is she stuck at that point? It depends uh, what sect and what community and what culture you come from. In some, you're not stuck. And in some, yes, indeed, you are stuck. In, mm. in fact, in most cases, you are stuck. But um mm. Muslim apologists will argue that, no, 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 don't paint a, a bad picture of Islam. The woman is not stuck. Well, look at reality. So you can pull any verses or any passages to, to, to make an argument that Islam is much better than what we're portraying here. But at the same time, if you look at reality, if you look at numbers, the majority of women are actually stuck in those scenarios. Yeah, and if and not by the religion, it's by the sorry by by family pressures and society pressures. Yeah. Oh no, I was just agreeing with you, and then that's really no different than like we said, you know, in fundamentalist Christianity, it's you know much the same story of you know, well, we're honoring and cherishing women, and and we're honoring them and protecting, protecting them by putting and, all of these yeah. restrictions on them, and it, you know, okay, well that's great, but that may not be the reality that is experienced <laughs> by by the women in these situations, but yeah, it's, it sounds very similar. Okay, and well. Yeah, I'll go ahead. I'm sorry, no, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to ask another question about that, but if you had more, go for it. It's it's just one one of the things that is very dear to me, and it's hardly talked about in in is, uh, Muslim marriages is uh, marital rape, which, as I said earlier, um, it, it's it's one of those things that um, God gives that authority to the man, and and basically. A woman has to give in whenever her husband wants her, and she shouldn't uh, say no, um, except for uh, the, the few days uh, during the month. That is the only time that she is allowed to refuse, and, and that is because uh, of, of that reason. <clears throat> but she shouldn't abuse, she, she shouldn't make the claim that um, yeah, it's, it's my period any time <laughs> of the. Yeah. Um, but other than that time, there is no such thing as I'm sorry, I'm tired or um, I'm sleepy or mm. I don't feel like it today. What do you mean you don't feel like it today? Because that reflects on the first thing I said when, when it, it's a contract. I freaking paid There's money for this. Right? Yeah. yeah. Wow. <laughs> it, it, it's a Ooh. contract. So there was money. It, it's almost like it, it's almost like prostitution. And I'm really, really sorry to, to throw that word in if, if that offends anyone. But Paying money, therefore, you are obliged to have sex with me. Come on. And um, it, yeah, it almost yeah. sounds I mean, that that's one way to describe it. I mean, another way to describe it would almost be like you, you're you just purchasing a human being like a sex slave. Uh, would would be another characterization, it sounds like. Um, but obviously, I don't mean to imply that that's what everyone is doing but i mean to yeah. your point if someone's in a situation where they're not able to refuse i mean i would call that rape yeah i mean care the i think the first time we had you on this show we were looking at different forms of gender and sexuality all over the world and what that can tell us kind of by contrast about our own culture and our own understanding of these things and mm -hmm. the more we get into this conversation, the more it feels like, well, yeah, but I mean, it might be that way on paper or that way in some extreme cases, but in reality, it's not. And I, and I know that that's true. 
But I also just see more and more the fact that it is that way on paper or at a minimum could be construed that way really does set everything up in some really, really gross and, and problematic ways that frankly mirror my understanding of evangelical Christianity and, and a lot of my experiences in ways that that aren't shocking, but that are, are certainly upsetting. Yeah, and, and honestly, I mean, I think some of these groups share some of the same texts or similar ones when they're sure. coming to these conclusions too about, you know, women's place in the home and the modesty and the purity and the virginity language. And, you know, we have the same, the same, or we have a passage in the Bible and Christianity that, that says that um, something like, you know, your, your body belongs to your spouse uh, for sex, mm -hmm. um, which is, you know, Wives don't deny your husbands. Yeah. Yeah. It's similar to what we're discussing here. Yeah. So I definitely don't want to make it sound like we're calling this out as some, you know, strange, exotic outrage that's happening out there somewhere. But, <laughs> <laughs> but it is a goddamn problem everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Well, OK. On on that note, <laughs> uh, how how would you say, do you have any more um, to say, Adam, about how marriage might impact the social standing or, or social access for men and women in differential ways? Like once you get married, what changes? What do you gain? What do you lose? Everything changes. <laughs> <laughs> um, <clears throat> marriage in religious context or the, the religious idea of marriage is that you kind of lose your individuality and you dissolve into this couple unit so, so you're, you're no longer an individual it's it's the the couple uh, and everything you do is supposed to be for the couple or for the family unit um and and that changes everything it changes your ambitions and your uh, way of living and and yeah, it, <laughs> I, I personally am not a, a pro marriage. I, th I think it's one of the most failing systems in the world. I mean, for God's sake, any system in the world that fails fifty percent of the time, look at the divorce rate. It's around fifty percent, no matter where you look in in the world, really, except in the Middle East, and that's because of societal pressure and family pressures that they don't want the family broken, and they try to force you to stay together so even if the numbers really do not reflect in the middle east that doesn't mean because they are happily married <laughs> sure. there's other reasons um so yeah i plus add add to that the idea that you cannot <clears throat> sexually explore your partner before marriage so mm. A lot of the idea of sexual compatibility is non-existent in religion. So there is no such thing as, yeah, I had sex with this person, uh, man or woman, and I don't like it. What, what do you mean you don't like it? <laughs> You're locked in, in a marriage. <laughs> it's your goddamn you, duty. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I, I don't want to go into a lot of details, but a lot of women specifically, they resent uh, their sexual life after marriage because they're locked in in a contract and when they only started exploring or experiencing sex for the first time they realized oh my god what have i done to myself and that's a, a life sentence basically yeah and i guess if you're in that situation there's not a whole lot of incentive for your partner to have to do anything to really wow you if you're kind of stuck no matter what. It reminds yeah. me of a book I read a while back. I'm sorry. Y'all thought I was going to go through a whole episode without recommending a book, didn't you? <laughs> it's not going to happen. Um, I read this book called, um, I think it's called Women Have Better Sex Under Socialism. Uh, and it's it's an interesting concept, but um, one of the arguments that they make in this book is that um, women who were living in a non-religious setting under um, basically the, the USSR during the Cold War um, in the, the Soviet Union, uh, their sex lives were suddenly different because of, you know, this 
lack of some of the social norms that would have people get stuck in a marriage with one partner for the rest of their lives. And some of the stories that people shared were of this idea that, well, if you're working under a a framework in which equal amount of, of effort is expected from all genders, then all of a sudden everyone's working a lot harder to impress their partner, and that includes sexually, <laughs> and that they had better sex lives as a result. Uh, so that was one perspective on that. I don't know why what you're saying just reminded me of that. But to add go. more insult to injury, um, if, if you put this concept with the polygamy, so the man doesn't have to impress because he can go and have multiple wives. He can go and have mm -hmm. sex with other women. But mm -hmm. then if the woman is stuck in that scenario, what can you do? The, the man has a ticket out in that case. Yeah, that's really a sort Messy. of unbalanced situation to find oneself in. I can yeah. certainly see how someone could take advantage of that. And it, but not to say that all people would, but it certainly leaves that opportunity there. I, I I hope more than anything though that folks watching tonight uh, can can I guess begin to notice how a lot of these same ideas look differently and wear different clothes so much so that they're kind of normalized and and maybe even ignored in American culture and yet they absolutely exist here. Uh, 